today we are having the last of our uh, Books That Shaped America series for this year. And the Books That Shaped America series is based on the Library of Congress Books That Shaped America list. This is a list of um, 80 some odd books that they believe uh, maybe weren't the most seminal works, but at least sparked a lot of conversation. So that's why they um, shaped America as it were. Today we have Tristan Cabello who is the Director of American Studies here at AU, and he's going to lead a discussion on the book uh, called And the Band Late On by Randy Schultz. And this is the story of how the AIDS epidemic spread and how the government um, was sort of initially didn't really do anything about it, seemed indifferent to it, which allowed it to spread maybe even further and what some of the outcomes were from that. Um, as I mentioned, he's Director of American Studies at American University, and his research explores the intersection of race, sexuality, class identities, and popular culture in modern American culture. His first monograph is called Queer Bronzeville, Race, Sexuality, and Black Chicago, 1920 to 1980, and it documents the making of African American queer identities in Chicago. Um, prior to uh, being here at AU, Cabello taught at University of Chicago, Northwestern University and Bowdoin College. Um, here at American, he teaches various courses in the American Studies program, among them, The Global Cultures of Michael Jackson, In the Life, Black Queer Culture and History, and Washington, D.C., Life Inside a Monument. So welcome, thanks for coming. Thank you. Well, thank you, Catherine, and thank you, uh, Danny, for inviting me to do uh, this conversation. Uh, I was really delighted when Danny invited me to lead the conversation on this book because uh, it is one of my favorite books and it's probably one of the books that actually influenced me to do what I'm doing today. And two, I think this is truly a book that shaped uh, American discourses on AIDS and HIV and those discourses are still influential uh, today. So uh, for the first part of the session, I guess I will present the book, uh, comment on the book, uh, uh, contextualize the book, uh, and then I will open up the floor for discussion and uh, a conversation. Uh, and of course, you should feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions and any comments to add uh, to my presentation. Uh, so for those of you who have no clue what the book is about, uh, the book chronicles uh, the first years of the AIDS epidemic in America. It starts in 1978 with the death of a Danish doctor uh, who contracted AIDS in Africa. And it ends in 1985 with the death of uh, Rock Hudson. Uh, and in most of my classes, I always have to explain who Rock Hudson was. Uh, Rock Hudson was a, uh, a very famous uh, actor in the Hollywood Golden Age in the 50s and the 60s uh, and then had a, a second career as a TV actor. And in June 1985, he comes uh, on TV with his very good friend Doris Day uh, for a press conference and he appears to be very frail. Um, and what he says also on TV doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and in June and in August 1985, he uh, discloses that he has AIDS um, and he dies shortly after in October 1985. Um, and here you see you know, how uh, extremely inelegantly AIDS patients or victims were treated at the time. I mean, they juxtapose a picture of him in his prime with uh, a picture of him uh, sick. Um, but after 1985, um, because this is the first celebrity that actually came out as um, an AIDS patient, uh, things start to change in the general public. But the bulk of the book uh, is between 1981 and 1985, um, and this is a time where, again, an AIDS diagnosis is a death sentence. Um, AIDS patients are not very well treated in hospitals and in uh, medical facilities. And the government, the media, um, the medical agencies are not doing too much to help. Hence the title of the book and the band played on. Uh, when I started graduate work in 2005, 
I realized that that was a book that was actually influential for many LGBT writers and scholars. They all cited the book as uh, one of the reasons why they started doing work in LGBT history. One, because they realized uh, that it was possible to do, that that was a, a valid field to explore. And in the 1980s and 1990s, there were not too many books uh, on uh, LGBT history. And two, they wanted to uh, replace um, agency at the center of LGBT historiography. Because as you will see in, um, later on in the presentation, um, AIDS victims in uh, Schilt's book are really that victims. He doesn't uh, spend a lot of time describing those victims who were actually readings, those patients who were actually readings obscure medical journal articles, importing drugs from Germany, Holland, France, having underground clinic um, just to help them uh, survive. Um, so let me give you some context uh, and a short history of the AIDS epidemic. Then I will explore the main themes in the book. Uh, and then I will talk also about um, few of its shortcomings. Um, does anybody know when AIDS was, when the first case of AIDS was reported in America? 76. No. Early 80s. Early 80s. It was actually in 1981. Uh, the first cases are reported uh, by uh, the CDC, and of course at the time it's not called AIDS, uh, in 1981 because there are um, uh, five gay men uh, who uh, have all been diagnosed with a strange form of uh, pneumonia, PCP, uh, which is usually uh, a form of pneumonia that you get when, um, uh, when people are much older first uh, and also when your immune system is uh, compromised. Um, so, uh, it's in June 5th, 1981 that the CDC sends the first report, but a couple of days earlier, the New York Times uh, already releases the news uh, that a rare cancer has been seen in 41 homosexual. Uh, that was, uh, I think, July the 2nd, and it's on page 49 of the New York Times. Um, and so there is this long articles about this cancer where uh, that nobody knows really um, how to treat. Uh, of course, that doesn't mean that AIDS appears in America in 1981. Uh, uh, we know for sure now that uh, we can trace the virus all the way to the 1900s uh, in Africa. And we know that in 1969, uh, a 15-year-old uh, African-American teenager from St. Louis uh, died of HIV, died of AIDS. Um, and we also know that this, uh, this patient, uh, this person, uh, started to develop symptoms in 1966. And we also know that he never got out of St. Louis. So that means that the virus was already present in the United States uh, in the 60s. Okay. Uh, but it doesn't get reported because it impacts um, marginalized communities and predominantly in the 70s probably uh, IV drug users okay, who do not have access to health care. Um, so why do these uh, first five cases emerge in 1981? Um, we are just uh, the Stonewall riots are just 12 years old in 1981. And there's a lot of things that happened in the 70s. The gay liberation movement, uh, gay newspapers, gay neighborhoods, uh, uh, gay prides. Um, and so uh, those five gay men here who are being reported as, uh, and it's all funny now to, to hear that as active homosexuals. Um, uh, are well off. Uh, they live uh, in uh, the Castro, in West Hollywood, in Greenwich Village. 
uh, they're well educated, they have good jobs, they have access to health care, and more importantly, uh, they are out to their doctors. It's 1981, and they are out to their doctors, or maybe even their doctors are gay, okay? And they have no problem discussing their sexuality because they are active, apparently, uh, with uh, their uh, doctors. Um, so, this is a very condensed timeline, ridiculously condensed timeline of um, the <coughs> history of the AIDS epidemic. Shields makes the argument in, um, in his book that the, the medical condition AIDS should have become a, a chronic manageable condition like diabetes uh, as early as 1985. Uh, and as you can see in the, in the short timeline here, uh, it, actually takes, uh, it actually takes 20 years uh, to, uh, to get a treatment that works. Uh, so in 1981, um, the CDC reports the first cases of pneumonia. In 1982, uh, they know that the disease is sexually transmitted. Uh, and they label the medical condition GRID. Uh, does anybody know what that refers to? Gay-related immune deficiency? Exactly, gay-related immune deficiency. So they link it to, uh, uh, to gay behaviors. Um, by 1982, they realized very early on, right? And 1982 is just a year after the first reports. They realized that half of the patients are actually not gay and they renamed the condition AIDS. Uh, in 1983, they know that uh, the virus is transmitted through blood and semen. In 1983, there's a team in Paris at the uh, uh, Institut Pasteur uh, under the leadership of uh, Professor Luc Montagnier that identifies the virus uh, that is believed to cause the medical condition AIDS, and they call it LAV. Okay, or LAV. Uh, there's another team right here in Bethesda uh, who, uh, that works on uh, identifying a, the virus too. And they discover another virus that they think is the one uh, that causes AIDS and they call it HTLV. Uh, they discover actually two viruses. They discover HTLV1 and HTLV2. Uh, by 1985, they find out, it takes, it takes two years, huh? uh, by 1985, they find out that uh, those two viruses, those two retroviruses, are actually the same. And the year after, uh, they finally agree on a name for that virus, and they call it HIV. And in 1987, uh, the, the FDA approves uh, the first drug to treat HIV, which uh, uh, do you remember what it was called? So it was it was marketed retrovir. It was so AZT was the actual name of the molecule, and it was uh, uh, it was sold under the name of retrovir. Okay, uh, that was AZT, and. Um, AZT uh, actually worked uh, for a while. It works for a couple of months, um, but then the virus becomes resistant to it. Uh, this is still a drug that's actually used randomly uh, nowadays in treatment, but in combination with other drugs. Um, in 1996, 10 years later, uh, the first cocktails uh, to treat HIV uh, are approved uh, by the FDA. Uh, the goal of uh, this treatment is to render the virus undetectable. Okay, so uh, people are still positive to HIV, but the virus is undetectable, which means it doesn't cause any uh, damage to uh, the body anymore. Um, and in, but those, uh, those first cocktails are, um, are very heavy in side effects. Uh, people are not dying of HIV or AIDS anymore. It does save lives, but people are dying of the side effects. 
uh, it raises cholesterol, blood pressure, it has all types of side effects. And in 2002, there's a second generation of, um, of uh, highly active antiretroviral therapy that comes onto the market uh, that uh, looks much better uh, with fewer side effects, fewer pills to take. Um, and uh, patients are actually uh, able to live uh, normal lives uh, under this treatment. Um, does anybody know what the situation looks like nowadays? Do we have a cure? No? So there are actually people who... Are, who uh, there's actually one person who got cured from HIV. Uh, the the Berlin patient, uh, the Berlin patient was a person that was uh, that both had leukemia and HIV, and uh, received a treatment. I'm I'm not a doctor. I'm not a biologist, so I don't know the details and don't quote me on this. Uh, but uh, received a treatment that involved a bone marrow transplant, and he was found out uh, HIV negative after. Uh, the bone marrow transplant, uh, which means that not only the virus had disappeared from his body, but, from his body, but also uh, the antibody. Uh, what does treatment look like nowadays? A lot of pills. I'm sorry? A lot of pills. Uh, well, actually, no. Uh, actually, nowadays, if you read the blade uh, uh, every week, uh, you see that there's a new pill that comes onto the market that's a, uh, a once-a-day pill uh, that, treats, uh, that, is, that, that treats HIV. So now the, the standard treatment for HIV uh, is we have a bunch of uh, once-a-day pill um, that uh, renders the virus undetectable. Okay. So the treatment nowadays, the gold standard treatment, is usually one pill per day. Uh, it's one pill, of course, that, that uh, combines several molecules. Huh? Uh, Do most uh, people who are positive get the same treatment, or are there a variety of treatments? I'm sorry? Does everyone get the same treatment, or are there a variety the of treatments? The CDC recommends a, a certain, uh, certain medication for people who get first, first diagnosed. Uh, I don't remember what they are, but uh, the gold standard right now is, I think, a pill uh, named Atripla. Uh, and uh, but there are several. Uh, uh, there are several. Some of them need to be taken with food. Some of them need to be taken in the morning. So usually the doctor uh, asks uh, the patient, you know, what works better uh, for the patient's routine. You know, um, but it is also true that the virus can develop resistance, and that treatment uh, needs to be changed. Uh, it's not a cure. It's absolutely not a cure. No, no. It is a treatment. It is a treatment. Um, and also, of course, uh, now what we have uh, is, uh, is a preventive treatment uh, that's called PrEP. That is a pill that uh, a lot of individuals are taking, um, a lot of individuals who are at risk uh, to prevent uh, infection. Okay. Um, that's uh, extremely popular in, in gay communities and... Um, and in uh, couples where uh, one of the member is uh, HIV positive, for example. And is that available worldwide or mostly in Western countries? Of course, there are all those pills, and that's the main problem uh, with HIV treatment. Those pills are available uh, in the Western countries, right? Uh, and, not if, and of course, not everybody in America has access to uh, those pills either. And they're expensive, I assume. They cost a minimum of two thousand dollars per month. Two thousand dollars. Is that prep or is the prep 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 costs twelve hundred dollars per month? That's that's of course the retail price. Nobody pays that price, of course. Huh? Uh, but prep, uh, which is a pill called uh, I forgot now, uh, Truvada. Uh, it's a blue pill. Uh, costs twelve hundred dollars per month. Okay. Of course, nobody pays that price, but still, uh, it, it is extremely expensive. You had a question? Yeah, how um, frequently is, do you take PrEP? 
you, you take it every day. Also yeah, it's uh, it's an every day. Or as long as you're sexually active. Well, as long as you're sexually active. Well, as long as you're sexually active, or when you are sexually active. But this is prep is is designed uh, uh, to prevent infection. So yes, it's as long as you are uh, sexually active. Uh, but again, it does help in, in populations who are uh, at risk. Uh, um, not everybody, of course, uh, does need to be on PrEP. Uh, and the medical uh, and the, the pharmaceuticals are making a lot of money also out of uh, this, uh, this pill. And so as I was doing uh, research, um, uh, uh, as I was looking at the latest uh, scientific research for this presentation, I realized that uh, now the life expectancy for a person who gets diagnosed with HIV in 2017 is approximately the same as the life expectancy of a person who uh, is diagnosed, was not diagnosed. Okay? Some doctors even argue that the life expectancy of a person who gets diagnosed with HIV in 2017 uh, may get a higher life expectancy simply because um, uh, uh, when you get diagnosed with HIV, uh, you need to go to the doctor much more often than uh, the regular person. Uh, and an HIV patient goes to the doctor every two, three months. Uh, so uh, any conditions uh, get uh, uh, treated and uh, diagnosed very early. Um, so that's for the context of the book. Let me talk a bit about uh, Schiltz, uh, who wrote the book. Schiltz uh, was born in 1951. He grew up in the suburbs of Chicago, and then he moves to Oregon uh, to get a degree in journalism. Um, and he comes out uh, in college at age 20. Uh, and when he graduates, he finds it, uh, this is the 70s, uh, he finds it very difficult to find employment. Um, so he moved to San Francisco, where everybody moves in, in the 1970s. And he finds uh, a job at the San Francisco Chronicle, when he is hired to report uh, on uh, gay news. And started in 1981, uh, he uh, exclusively uh, reports on AIDS. Um, on the side, uh, Schiltz writes a lot of books, uh, a lot of books. He published four in his lifetime, but he, he works on books. Um, and one of the books that uh, he works on in uh, the late 70s is a biography of uh, Harvey Milk. Uh, and it's on this biography that the recent movie that was uh, uh, out in 2007-2008 with uh, Champagne uh, was based on. Um, he starts working on End the Band Played On in 1983, uh, but the book is published in 1987. Uh, again, guys, it's, I don't know if you saw it, but it's a 600-page uh, book. It's a long book. Um, what he works on the book uh, he regularly gets tested for HIV, but he does ask his doctor not to disclose the results to him because he doesn't want to be biased as he writes the book. And in 1987, uh, is after the book is published, um, his doctor uh, tells him that he's HIV positive. And almost instantly, um, uh, Schiltz starts taking ACT uh, and he dies uh, in the mid-1990s. Uh, uh, what's interesting about Schiltz is that he uh, actually never disclosed his status. Uh, all the way until the, uh, not until uh, a couple of weeks before he died. Okay, he never said that he was uh, HIV positive. At some point, when he becomes HIV positive, when he hears the news that he's HIV positive and that he has to go on treatment, uh, he moves out of San Francisco. Uh, he works on another book um, on uh, gay soldiers during the Vietnam War. Uh, but uh, we do not see him anymore. He doesn't appear on TV anymore. 
so what is the book about? Um, the book uh, chronicles the early years of the AIDS epidemic and the argument is basically contained in the title uh, while everybody was dying uh, people uh, because the subtitle of the book is uh, Politics, People and the AIDS Epidemic uh, and what's under that uh, umbrella term of people is uh, gay communities, medical communities, the news media, uh, government agencies um, did not do anything. Uh, first, uh, Shields talks at length about uh, gay communities in the Castro and in Greenwich Village. Uh, and as I reread uh, the book last week, um, I realized that there's a bit of um, there's a bit of self-loathing. Uh, there's a bit of what uh, psychologists would call uh, internalized homophobia. Uh, he criticizes a lot uh, the reactions of. Uh, gay men uh, in the Castro and in Greenwich Village and often this description is very one-dimensional he doesn't try to understand why they reacted a certain way uh, and he often label them he often labels them as them as if he's actually excluding himself from uh, the wider community um, for example, he criticizes uh, gay men of the Castro for uh, being very angry when uh, or refusing uh, the idea that bathhouses in San Francisco should be closed. Uh, by 1984, the city issues an ordinance uh, asking, uh, requiring all bathhouses to be closed. Uh, in order to contain the epidemic. And uh, gay males in the Castro are reacting very violently to that. They're not happy. Uh, and uh, Randy Shields labeled them as immature. Uh, but of course, those were men also, but on the, on the other hand, uh, those were men who uh, had moved to the Castro for that precise reason, uh, to have sex with other men. Uh, those were men who had gone through years of uh, shaming wherever they lived uh, outside of San Francisco. Uh, and those uh, were people who did not believe that there could be such a thing, such a, a, a disease, a virus that only uh, attacked or infected gay people. Uh, and actually, uh, one of uh, the most famous uh, quotations about AIDS uh, uh, by Michel Foucault, by the French theorist Michel Foucault, uh, is, uh, is kind of valuable in that context. Uh, Michel Foucault is very well known to, uh, to have said in 1983, uh, a disease that only kills gay men uh, is too good to be true. Uh, and of course, Michel Foucault dies uh, a couple of years later of um, of, uh, of the medical condition. So uh, it's often the story of uh, villains and heroes, and they are the irresponsible, childish uh, gay men who still want to have sex uh, in bathhouses. And there are uh, the heroes, and the heroes are often uh, those uh, activists who have tried to uh, save the community. Here, for example, Larry Kramer is the, on the first picture, and uh, uh, Bill Krauss on the second picture. Larry Kramer was very active in New York. Bill Krauss was very active in uh, San Francisco. But he never really critiques also uh, their activism, which at times was uh, problematic. Uh, Shields also tells the story of what was happening in the medical community um, and uh, so he tells the story of uh, how many doctors in San Francisco, many gay, gay doctors in San Francisco, LA, New York um, actually helped uh, patients but he also tells the story uh, that uh, the medical staff was not really aware 
uh, of um, the way HIV uh, was uh, transmitted and so did not treat uh, AIDS patients uh, fairly. Um, often uh, AIDS patients were not uh, touched, uh, they were not provided with meals. Uh, some nurses refused to uh, do blood work uh, on AIDS patients. But more importantly, he spends a lot of time, uh, and I think that this is one of the, um, the best rendering of, of, of that battle, um, explaining um, the battle between the French team and the American team uh, in the discovery of the virus. Uh, because for three years, four years actually, um, uh, those teams are fighting against uh, the discovery of the HIV virus. Um, on the first picture you have one person that worked with under Luc Montagné. Luc Montagné never did uh, a lot of research on AIDS, but he had a team of researchers that he was supervising. And so uh, uh, Willy Rosenbaum here on the first picture uh, was one of the co-discoverers of the HIV virus. And of course, uh, Françoise Barré-Sinoussi, who just got the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago, was the, co the other co-discoverer of uh, the HIV virus. And Robert Gallo, who was working uh, here in Bethesda, uh, those two teams were fighting uh, over who uh, actually discovered the virus first. And it lasted three years. Um, and Randy Shields really does a good job in detailing uh, what that battle, what that struggle was, uh, was about. And of course, uh, he does uh, talk uh, a lot about um, the lack of response from the government. Uh, as, uh, as it is well known, um, Ronald Reagan did not utter the word AIDS until uh, 1985, uh, and that was in a press conference. And it's not until uh, 1987 that Ronald Reagan gives his first speech uh, on AIDS. And of course at first, and it's very interesting because it's given in uh, that organization that uh, Elizabeth Taylor um, uh, presides. Um, and the first part of the speech uh, is excellent. He says what everybody wants to hear. We need to treat AIDS patients with compassion, with love. We need to integrate them into our families and so on and so forth. Uh, and then he drops the bomb. Uh, he announces that uh, all HIV positive individual uh, will be banned from entering the country. Uh, that means that uh, HIV was actually added to the list of uh, communicable diseases uh, that uh, would make you not only ineligible to enter the United States, but also to, also to get a visa, to get a permanent residency, to get uh, citizenship. Um, and the ban uh, was still in place until uh, 2009. Uh, so until 2009, technically, uh, an HIV-positive person could not enter uh, the United States. Uh, of course, nobody was testing people at the border, right? But that means that people were hiding their medications, uh, or did not take their medications. Uh, and it also means that a lot of people were eligible for permanent residency, for example, or for visas, um, uh, did not apply, right? Because, uh, because for visas and for permanent residency, they actually did test uh, people. Uh, so that's what the book is about. Um, and it's a very good book for uh, getting the facts about uh, the first couple of years of the AIDS epidemic. Uh, but as I said in the beginning, the book also displays a few uh, shortcomings. And I think it also contributed to uh, shaping um, 
stereotypical discourses on AIDS uh, in America. Uh, first, uh, this is not a uh, scholarly book. Uh, Shields never claimed to be an historian. Shields never claimed to be an academic. It's the book of a journalist. So there are scenes where, for example, uh, he describes an AIDS patient alone dying in his room in, in a hospital. And he knows what the AIDS patient is thinking. Uh, so, of course, there's, there's absolutely no way of uh, knowing precisely what that person was thinking uh, all alone in his room. Uh, and for a book that's 600 page long, uh, there are actually three pages of footnotes. So we do not really know what the sources are, and most of the sources that he quotes are actually his own articles uh, that he published in the San Francisco Chronicles. So uh, this is a book that uh, has kind of a hybrid position in AIDS historiography because it is the first one. It is the first book that we have on the AIDS epidemic, uh, but it's not really rigorous. Okay? It does give the fact. Uh, it creates a discourse very clearly, uh, but it's not a scholarly book. Uh, two, there is absolutely no diversity in this book. Um, it is, although Shields uh, does argue uh, in the first couple of pages that uh, in the very first year we know that the virus, that AIDS, that the condition um, affects people beyond race, sexual orientation, gender, etc., etc. Uh, this is a book that primarily focuses on white gay males uh, who lived in uh, gay neighborhoods. Um, and this uh, really could have been corrected if, uh, if, um, if Schiltz had read the sources that he had uh, a little bit more in detail. Because, for example, we know that Schiltz had access to the listing of people who were diagnosed with AIDS um, early on in 1981, 1982 in San Francisco. Of course, an anonymous listing. Uh, people were listed by number. Um, and we do know that patient number six and patient number eight uh, were actually African-American gay males who live in the Castro. But he never talks about them. Uh, he does a lot of research on the first five, uh, but he doesn't really talk that much about um, about um, other people who were uh, in, in, impacted by the virus. Uh, and also, uh, quite frankly, uh, he puts a lot of emphasis on uh, the activism that was uh, done um, uh, in Greenwich Village, in, uh, in uh, the Castro, in West Hollywood. Uh, uh, but does not talk about the activism, the very real activism uh, that was also done in Harlem, in Oakland, in, on the South Side. Uh, for example, I know, uh, because this is the research that I do, that very early on, on the South Side of Chicago, in a uh, black gay club in 1983, uh, they already had meetings about what was called at the time HTLV. And they already had uh, meetings about with people who were um, uh, impacted uh, by the disease, infected with HTLV, talking about uh, the way it was transmitted and uh, the way transmission could be uh, prevented. So very early on, um, uh, not only in white gay neighborhoods, uh, in black neighborhoods, in Latino neighborhoods, in working class neighborhoods, there were a lot of work that was being done and uh, that Schiltz doesn't really uh, touch on. Uh, and finally, there's this. Uh, does anybody know who that person is? Patient Zero. Patient Zero, right. <laughs> so... It's been in the news recently. 
Of course, but I mean, it's always in the news because there's... What was it in the news recently? That they've just proven that he had anything to do with... Oh, yeah, of, yeah, 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 of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, this is patient zero. Uh, his real name is Gaëtan Dugas. He's a French-Canadian flight attendant. Um, and he's one of the main characters in the book. Um, and more importantly, this is one of the characters, this is one of the plot line that's used to publicize the book on TV, on radio, in the newspaper. And as I said, Duga is a French-Canadian gay man. Uh, he's a flight attendant. He's traveled all over America since 1972, all over North America since 1972. Uh, he knows that he's, uh, he has the cancer. Uh, he is diagnosed with the cancer. Uh, very early on, but he chooses not to believe that uh, the cancer is sexually transmitted, and he chooses to continue to have a sex life. Okay, uh, and so he's labeled as patient zero because Shields believe that he's that person that spread the virus all over America, uh, and. Uh, and more importantly, and the book is really described as uh, kind of being mentally unstable, having this sociopathic behavior uh, that is infecting people on purpose, um, uh, that is infecting people intentionally uh, uh, with a virus that we have not even identified yet. Okay? Um, so there's a couple of issues here. Uh, first, uh, and this is where sometimes Schiltz lacks in terms of rigorous research. Uh, Duga was never uh, mentioned as being patient zero in the scientific literature that was available at the time. Um, he was uh, numbered patient uh, 57 in San Francisco, uh, but he was also dubbed patient O because he was from outside the area, okay? Uh, so it seems here that Shields misreads uh, uh, the sources that he has access to. Uh, two, Shields never mentions the fact that uh, Duga was actually quite uh, influential in identifying the way uh, the disease was transmitted. Uh, because most of uh, the patients that uh, most of the AIDS patients that doctors were treating uh, in San Francisco at the time uh, averaged uh, 400 to 500 sexual partners a year. Uh, and Duga claimed, uh, it's not that he claimed, it's that we know, uh, that between 1972 and 1981 he had 2,500 sexual partners. And how do we know that is because Duga keeps a sex diary. He keeps a log. He records in his diary who he has sex with, where he has sex with, uh, in what city he is, etc., etc. And Gaëtan Duga, uh, being this French-Canadian uh, flight attendant with a thick accent and uh, uh, described in the book as being gorgeous, uh, is also uh, readily identifiable. People do remember him. You know, people who had, had sex with him do remember him. Uh, so, uh, the doctors can actually trace very easily and confirm uh, um, ways uh, the virus was uh, transmitted. Uh, and Finally, uh, this is an issue that's still relevant today. Uh, 24 states in America still require uh, HIV positive people to uh, disclose their status before they have sex with somebody. Uh, and the sentence uh, for uh, not disclosing uh, can be quite heavy. Uh, it, uh, it's jail time, uh, and, it could, and it could be lifetime in prison. Huh? Um, and so it seems that here, um, uh, what I'm getting at is that uh, uh, Shields already 
uh, classifies uh, AIDS patients. Uh, they are the victims, you know, uh, the hemophiliacs, um, Ryan White, uh, those who died of horrible death uh, in, uh, in the beginning of the book. Uh, and there are those, uh, those who continue to have sex, uh, which will become, you know, later on, um, uh, uh, the guys on the downloads or the guys who are not disclosing their status, you know. Um, and very, very recently, actually, um, there is a, a, a college student, uh, well, his real name is not Tiger Mandigo, his name, his name is Michael Johnson, um, that was uh, sentenced uh, to uh, 10 years in jail, I think, for not disclosing his status to uh, four uh, four of his sexual partners. Uh, throughout the trial, he claimed his innocence. Uh, he said that he actually disclosed uh, his status, uh, but still was sentenced uh, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to jail. Uh, so the criminalization of uh, you know, HIV transmission is still uh, a, a problem, you know, nowadays uh, in America, people, people are being deported for those reasons, people are in jail for those reasons, um, and, and I think that this is one of the issues, you know, that actually, um, actually starts uh, being discussed um, in the book. Um, that's all that I wanted to say for today, and I think I exceeded the time that was allotted to me. But for those of you who uh, do not want to go through those 600 pages, uh, the book was actually turned into a movie uh, that's uh, pretty good, uh, but still pretty long, more than two hours, uh, fascinating with Phil Collins in the role of a... Uh, uh, bathhouse owner. Um, it's a, it's a really good movie, and it does justice to the book, which is already uh, written like a, like a movie script, really. So thank you guys for your time, and if you have any questions, any comments, uh, I'm happy to uh, to take those. What became of the um, uh, you got? You say recently it was again. In well, just the fact that they'd identified that he was not the cause of AIDS in America, that he didn't bring it to the U.S. It was uh, identified mostly in the book as the one guy who... The book was marketed on the ID that uh, this was the guy who, uh, who brought AIDS to America, or who spread AIDS in the United States, because he was a flight attendant that was having sex with a lot of people all over the U.S., uh, and of course, I mean, even at the time, I don't know how anybody could believe that, but uh, uh, very shortly after the book was released, a lot of doctors have actually said that that made actually no sense at all. Uh, um, and now we know that the virus was present in America, you know, probably uh, as early as 1960, so uh, it really made no sense. But the fact that he's scapegoating him for uh, the fact that Shields himself believes that is pretty so problematic. Do you think he believed it, or do you think he added it or enhanced the idea that there was one guy who was? Um, the what after Shields died, uh, Shields actually never said anything about patient zero. Uh, but after Shields died, his publisher said that he encouraged. Shields to flesh out the story about Patient Zero. Uh, he encouraged him to talk more about him uh, in the book uh, because he thought that that would, that would be a setting point. Uh, and indeed, uh, in interviews at the time, uh, this is really what they talk about. I mean, they talk about Patient Zero uh, all the time. Uh, yeah. I 
I've read it in 1997, and that's the part I remember the best. No, of course, I mean, because it takes so, so much of the book anyway. I mean, we yeah. know everything about this guy, you know, and even in the movie, uh, you see this guy all the time. I mean, and, and he's really portrayed as this completely immature, where, where he says a couple of very smart things to the doctors, too. I mean, he tells them, well, you know, 30 years ago, you guys thought that I was diseased just because I was gay. Uh, so, and how can a cancer be transmitted sexually, you know, uh, so he has some very valid points, you know, at the time. Was he alive when the book was published? No, he died in 1984 and the book was published in 1987. Isn't the title a reference to the Titanic? The same thing probably, yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, 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 yeah. As the world, as everything is crumbling and falling apart around you, the band is playing on like nothing is happening. The government is fumbling, yeah, and, yeah. and everyone is ignoring what is happening. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. And you come across any research on uh, comparing the way um, society has handled this disease versus others? Um, Ebola or others that have mysterious diseases that have had to be characterized as quickly as possible in order to see was society any slower in evaluating this one versus some of the others. I don't know. Um, I don't, Ebola is the only other one I can think of. SARS. 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 Right. There's a lot of hysteria mm. with SARS. Well, it seems that we've learned a lot from the AIDS epidemic, right? Um, and at the same time, uh, it seems that Shields, um, Shields explains everything by um, some sort of homophobia that was uh, pervasive through medical agencies, government agencies, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's probably right for, for, uh, for, for a part. Uh, but it's true also that those medical agencies move very slowly in uh, many cases. And that's what we've learned with the AIDS epidemic. So for example, for Ebola, they move much faster. Um, and then, you know, when uh, later on, when, uh, for example, the, um, the FDA had drugs that were actually proven to be uh, efficient. And you know that the process at the FDA is also a very long process. Um, and when ACT UP actually uh, chained themselves literally to the, to, to the FDA, uh, to ask the FDA to release those drugs, well, the process of releasing drugs, the process of approving drugs was uh, shortened, you know. So uh, it's true that we've learned uh, a lot with the AIDS epidemic about how to handle, you know, those, uh, those new viruses, you know, that, that are uh, threatening uh, us. Absolutely. Uh, now the title escaped me, but uh, Jennifer Breyer uh, from uh, UIC, um, uh, Infectious IDs, uh, has written, I think, what I, I think the best book on the AIDS epidemic. Uh, it's a book that dates uh, 2012. Uh, published by the University of Chicago and it's called Infectious IDs and the name of the author is uh, Jennifer Breyer. Uh, that's probably the best book that we have so far about the historiography of the AIDS epidemic. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, Thank you. Please. Uh,